All right, so this is our soul winning workshop number four. We're going to start getting into a little bit more specific um, issues that you run into when you go out soul winning. We've covered a lot of the basics in the first three, um, just the overall outline and focusing on internal security and things like that. So today I wanted to focus on um, when you go out soul winning, you run into someone who's a Jehovah's Witness or a Mormon. And I kind of lumped them together. They're real similar. Yeah. Um, they have a lot of the same false doctrines. This is geared a little bit more towards Jehovah's Witnesses. We run into more of them up here than we do Mormons. Um, I, I was really familiar with the Mormons and Gilbert when I'd run into them out there. But um, I'm focused a little bit more towards JW. They've got a few more kind of crazy doctrines than, than the Mormons do. But overall, basically, I just want to start off by saying ultimately it doesn't matter like um, I don't want you to get too hung up on focusing on any one individual type of person you know like especially if you're newer at soul winning the gospel is the gospel is the gospel it's the same for everybody everyone has to believe the same exact thing to get saved so if you don't know what these people believe that are weird or they're different, don't stress about it. Don't worry about it. You'll, you'll start to learn more over time anyways as you get some experience. But there are some things that are helpful to know in advance about what they believe that can help you get through the gospel better and understand what you need to focus on a little bit more that might hinder somebody from getting saved that believes in these false doctrines. So. Um, just right off the bat, a lot of times when, when I talk to people at the door, usually we start off kind of asking what church they go to. If I know in advance that they go to a kingdom hall, because that's what Jehovah's Witnesses go to, then I do not ask them, because normally the next question is, well, if you were to die right now, do you know for sure you're going to heaven? I say, do you know that you're saved? And it may be a subtle difference, but they don't believe that people like go to heaven other than the excuse me, 144,000 people. They're not going to explain their doctrine. It doesn't matter. Um, so right off the bat, you can get started off kind of on a rabbit trail that, that ultimately isn't going to matter. I mean, what, what your goal is, you want to try to get the gospel out there if possible. If they're going to listen to you at all, you don't want to get started talking about a detail, which is it important? Sure, it's an important detail, but you don't want to start off there. So right off the bat, I just use the term saved. It's pretty safe. And it, and it takes a little bit of conditioning of yourself if you're used to saying, you know, if you die today, you know 100% for sure you're going to heaven. Because it's something that, that a lot of people use as, as kind of an opening sentence. But if you know in advance that they're, they're already a Jehovah's Witness, I would avoid using that. Because it just gets you off on the whole thing. Well, I don't believe in heaven. I don't, you know, and then you kind of get, get off on a rabbit trail. Um, that's just the first tip. Um, a lot of the common hang-ups between the Jehovah's Witnesses and the Mormons, you'll see the deity of Christ is a big one, and that, that is important. You know, you, you've got to believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He's God in the flesh to get saved. I mean, you've you got to believe in the right Jesus. They believe in a Jesus. It's a false Jesus. It's not the right Jesus. Um, they believe in work salvation. And most of them won't even try to disguise it. The Mormons try to disguise it a little bit more. Jehovah's Witnesses won't even disguise that they believe in a work salvation. And then um, hell is another thing that they, you know, had, they, they're way off on. So I have listed here some verses, not in, in a whole, necessarily in any particular order. But assuming, again, the goal is to try to get the gospel out. Try to go through the plan of salvation the way that you normally would. If they'll allow it. Now, we always, on the back here, I, I just, we always want to be careful um, at the very end, I, the last verse I have on there is Titus chapter 3. The Bible says, But avoid foolish questions and genealogies and contentions and strivings about the law, for they are unprofitable and vain. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject. Always keep this in your mind when you're giving the gospel to people who are, especially when they're entrenched in a false religion. Because we're out to win souls. We're not out to win debates. We're not out to, to, because you could, look, I've done it before. You could mop the floor with these guys and you could win the argument. But if they're still just unbelieving, you, you've, what have you accomplished? 
You know, that's it, not the point. It, you know, don't, don't get puffed up in your own knowledge either of just, well, I'm going to show this guy, right? Um, the goal is, is to get them saved. And right. one of the things that, that I try to do, because I, I, really I really try to give people benefit of the doubt, but you have to be looking to see, are they listening to what you're saying? Are you having a conversation or are they just waiting for their turn to speak to just tell you why you're wrong and what you know and, and just just come up with every opposition? If that's the case, see you later. Because their heart's not even ready to receive the word. This is for people that are actually engaging in conversation and are being reasonable and, and listening and, and, you know, and, and being, uh, having a discourse with you. They don't have to believe right away, obviously. I mean, you're, you're trying to challenge their faith and persuade them to believe the truth. But so if, if someone's being reasonable, that's why I have all this stuff on here because there's, there are plenty of people that will give you the, the courtesy and, and have, an, have an exchange where, where you, can, you, know, you can actually talk to them honestly. And if they're in any way open a little bit, then that's great. And we want to be able to really attack their hang-ups. Um, you know, especially if you could get, especially if you get through the gospel and say, okay, you know, here's, let me just tell you the gospel of Christ. You know, let me just show you this real quick, and try to do it without interruptions, where you can just be like, well, let, let me run, let me just tell you what I believe. You know, you may have heard what Baptists believe and stuff, but let me just tell you what I believe, right? Because maybe, maybe I believe something that that you think I believe that I don't really believe. Just, just to get it out there. That way you can just kind of run through the whole, the whole plan of salvation and then go back to points that you know they're not going to believe in, like the deity of Christ. Um, if, if I only have time to get on one thing, I usually spend the time on the work salvation. Um, that's why I have on here Romans 11.6. That's a verse I like to use. And I also I like to use verses that... Um, they're not necessarily ready for. And again, this, this kind of gets a little bit more advanced when you're out soul winning. You, you start to learn the specific passages that, that overall Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons will have some kind of stupid answer for that they think is just answers the problem and then, and then they just kind of shut down and they don't think about it anymore. I try to use certain verses that they, that in my experience, they don't have a very good answer for it because they haven't really heard it before. Because they're not always dealing with a Baptist at their door trying to get them saved. You know, they, they're taught a few things, like, you know, their apologetics on, on certain verses and stuff, but they don't cover them all. And it's very rare when you run into someone that, that has a really good knowledge of their false religion, you know. So I like Romans 11, 6. That's a little bit of a tongue twister, but if you, you know, if, if you take the time through it, you can get, get them to see because Basically, what they believe is that you can't have faith without works. And they always run to James 2, and I have that on here too. And, you know, I'm going to go out of order because that's just fine. One good tip is make sure you, for yourself, understand James 2 pretty well. You understand what it's talking about so they don't kind of stump you and throw you for a loop and they say faith without works is dead. Know how to answer that. And there's entire sermons I've preached on that. You could look that up. Um, but just be comfortable with James 2 with these types of people. Um, they're going to, that, that's always where they go. They always want to go to that. And I also want to point out, don't go on this verse for verse thing either. Like, um, I've done this before. I've seen other people do it where like, we'll say, well, what do you think about this verse? And then they'll say, well, what do you think about this verse? And they go, well, what do you think about this verse? And then what do you think about this verse? You know, and like, you're never really settling on anything. You're just, you're just kind of going back and forth and the problem with that is that that's almost implying like there's a contradiction in the Bible. Right. Like, because now you're just saying, well, what about this and what about this? Well, no, they all have to agree. Right. So what I like to try to do is when you get someone and you get them a little bit squirmy because they don't know how to answer it, and then they want to just dodge the question and bring up some other topic, don't let them do that to you. Stay on course and be like, no, wait a minute, wait, no, we haven't sufficiently addressed this yet. We'll get to that in a minute, but what about this? And like I have Isaiah 9, 6 on here. That's um, where it gives all the names of Jesus for unto us. A child is born unto us, a son is given, his name shall be, you know, wonderful counselor, the mighty God. And I've had, it's funny because when I go to that verse, I'm going to point out that his name is the everlasting father. 
They think I'm going there because it says the mighty God. They say, well, it's not the almighty God. You know, and they're like already answering that. But whoa, 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 wait a minute. Okay, hold on. Why is the Son the Father? How can that be? How, how is he the everlasting Father of all time? You know? And that's a good verse. And, and it usually, you know, a lot of times, because they'll, they'll be somewhat prepared for that verse, but not, not completely. And that's, that's a good one to explain the deity of Christ. And again, I just, I just want to reiterate, this isn't for a debate. It's because, and remember this when you're at the door, you're challenging their belief. And with a lot of people, it's going to be hard to do. It, 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 I mean, think about yourself if someone were to challenge you before you got saved and, and what you believe, especially if you were believing something false. It's going to take some convincing. And the stronger you're holding to something, the more convincing it's going to take. And recognize that, you know, be... Be sympathetic to that in a way where, where you can be giving the gospel so that you're, you know, you're working with them. As long as it's not just a fight and they're at least somewhat receiving it, I would keep going. And I spend as much time, I've spent you know, an hour, an hour and a half with some of these guys where I don't feel like it was a waste of time because they weren't just jumping around and dodging and just completely avoiding things. We were having a legitimate con you know, discussion and, and they were thinking about things a lot. And that's what you, you'd want to get, you know, because you're trying to plant these seeds and get them in there, even if they don't get saved that day. You want to be able to present enough doubt in their mind that what they've been taught is a lie that maybe even later on, you know, they'll go back and look at this stuff and realize, yeah, you know what, this just doesn't add up. And this is why I'm even taking the time to go so much in depth in this today is to, to give you some more ammunition, maybe some of the stuff you've known and used, maybe some of you haven't. Um, Romans 11.6, I mentioned it earlier, it says, And if by grace, then is it no more of works? Otherwise, grace is no more grace. But if it be of works, then is it no more grace? Otherwise, work is no more. You say, this completely separates works and grace. Amen. It's just they're two different things. Mm -hmm. And they want to merge them and say, no, it's all one. And say, nope, you, have to have, you can't have one without the other. And this says the exact opposite, right. is that they're completely separate. You cannot work for something and have it be free, a free gift. It's, it's completely opposite. So that's a pretty good verse. And I've, all, I've noticed that that's one that they don't tend to just have an automatic response for. Um, another question I like to ask them is, well, who's the Savior? Isaiah 43, Isaiah 44, and Isaiah 45. If you don't, you know, if you don't have them memorized, just, just remember those chapters. Because you could scan through them real quick and you'll find stuff immediately. But I like to ask the question first, who's the Savior? Because they'll all say Jesus. Well, Jesus is the Savior. Well, look what Isaiah 43 says. Isaiah 43, 11. I even I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. So who's the Savior? You know, when you believe in the Trinity, when you believe that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh, that's not a problem. There's no contradiction. There's, it's absolutely fine. But when you believe that they're separate, and you have Jehovah Lord saying, there is no Savior but me, then why are you calling Jesus the Savior? Given, get, get, you know, getting them to think. And while you're in Isaiah, you could say, but then I also tie this in with the, how many gods do you believe? And again, this is a lot more geared towards Jehovah's Witnesses, but you can still use this with the Mormons. The Mormons use the King James Bible. So in some senses, it's a little bit easier because they're gonna, you, you're not going to have as much, you know, um, you know, if they want to argue about what version you're using, well, you're using the King James. But they don't believe it like we do. They, 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 I mean, they don't believe it at all, but, yeah. but they also believe that there's errors and, and things that are wrong in it too. So just be aware of that. But um, in the New World Translation, the Jehovah's Witness Bible, John 1.1 1, 1 says, In the beginning was the Word, the Word was with God, and the Word was a God. That's what their Bible says. So it's good to know that. Because that's one of the verses I like to use for the deity of Christ. But I'm also, it's also good to be aware of what their false version says because I tend to avoid those unless I'm making a specific point about it. Like in this case, I'm going to make a specific point. Isaiah 44, 6 says, Thus saith the Lord, the King of Israel, and his Redeemer, the Lord of hosts, I am the first and, the la and I am the last, and beside me there is no God. So is, Jesus, is the word a God or not? Because Jehovah said there is no God beside me. There's none. And, and you could find, you could actually find a bunch of verses that say the same thing. It's, it's, it's all throughout Isaiah 43, 44, and 45. It, it, I mean, they're all scattered in there. I just chose one. I don't even have them highlight or anything. I just, I just open them up. I'm just be like, oh yeah, look at this verse right here. Because I know in all the chapters, it's, it's all throughout. There's Isaiah 45, 5, I am the Lord and there is none else. 
There is no God beside me. It's like, how much more clear can he be? I girded thee, though thou hast not known me, that they may know from the rising of the sun and from the west that there is none beside me. I am the Lord and there is none else. You know, he goes on and on, like just reiterating, there is none. So how many gods do you believe in? And look, and again, this isn't, <laughs> this isn't to be argumentative where you're, we're going, you know, where it turns into just contention in the sense of like, you know, they're mad at you and, you're, you know, and they just want to debate you. Because if that's the case, leave. Right. There's no fruit in that. This is to just to, to show them you've got a problem with your doctrine, with what you believe. It's false. You've been lied to. And here's why, because of these scriptures. Um, you could also go, if you, you know, I didn't write it down here, but when he says in Isaiah 44, 6, I am the first and I am the last, you could show him in Revelation 1 where Jesus Christ says the same exact thing. Who's the first and the last? Who's talking to John? And you can prove um, that, that that is Jesus. You can actually prove from the context that that's Jesus talking to John, not Jehovah. So um, another, another tip, another tool, you know, put it, put it in your bag of... of, of uh, you know, your arsenal to, to, to bring out against these people. Uh, John 20, this will work for, for JWs and for Mormons. It's the story of Doubting Thomas, right? Where he, he, um, he says, unless I could stick my hand in the print of his nails, and, you know, like, he's like, I'm not going to believe. But look at what he says in John 20, 28. He says, you know, when Jesus tells them, okay, put your hand here, you know, it's really me. And Thomas answered and said unto him, My Lord and my God. Thomas calls Jesus Christ God. He's like, My God. The Ten Commandments say you shouldn't have any other God before you. Thomas calls him My Lord and my God. And then Jesus, what does he do? Does he rebuke him and say, No, you should have no other gods before Jehovah? No, the exact opposite. He says, Because you've seen me, you believe. So blessed are they that have not seen and yet believed. Believed what? Believed that Jesus Christ is his Lord and his God. And, um, you know, so again, proving the deity of Jesus Christ. On the back of the page there, we've got some references to hell. I prefer, I've got Mark 9.43 on there through 48, um, which is fine because this is Jesus Christ talking about hell. But I prefer to use Revelation 14 and Revelation 20, where it just goes through the, uh, the eternity of hell, the torture and torment of hell. Not, you know, the JWs think that you just basically get burned up, you're annihilated, and, and that's it, and it's over, and it just, it just poof happens in an instant. You just kind of cease to exist. Um, so I'll ask him, I'll say, well, what about when people take the mark of the beast? Because this is a special case. Revelation 14, if you read it in context, this is talking about people who take the mark of the beast, right? And I try to be real fair with that. You don't want them to come back at you later and say, well, this isn't everybody. Okay, let's just talk about people who take the mark of the beast. Because they don't believe anyone's going to be tortured and tormented in hell. So here's the specific example. Revelation 14. What about those people? What happens to them? Well, it says in verse 10, The same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture, into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascendeth up, forever and ever, and they have no rest, day nor night, who worship the beast in his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So, I mean, it's pretty clear. It's saying you're not just like cease to exist. He's saying you're tormented. You have no rest. You are, you know, you are in a place of torture and torment day and night, forever and ever. Uh, Revelation 20.10 basically says the same thing because it's talking about the same place, the, the fire and brimstone, the lake of fire. And this is talking about the devil being tortured and tormented um, and shall be tormented day and night forever and ever. Literally spells out, you will be tormented day and night forever and ever. And that, that you don't just cease to exist. So again, they have a problem with, with that doctrine of hell. And these are the ones I touch on. They have a lot of other things that are screwed up on. But to get the gospel, to get salvation, they need to know Jesus Christ and get the right Jesus Christ. Amen. The reason why I need Jesus Christ is because there is this place called hell. It's real. It's a reality. It's, it's, a, it's the punishment for our sins. And um, it's not based on works. It's only by grace. So these are the, and, and you know, I didn't, I didn't put a lot of verses on here on eternal security because we've covered that already. 
The last soloing workshop we did all dedicated to eternal security. So it's the same gospel. <laughs> it's the same birth, it's the same evidence that you can use to support why we have eternal life. Um, last couple tips. I think I mentioned this earlier. I try to use scripture that's going to say essentially the same thing in their Bible, which is one of the reasons why I really like Isaiah 43, 44, and 45 because they haven't changed that. They haven't messed with that. I mean, yeah, the wording's a little bit different, but it's gonna, you're going to make the same point with what their Bible says uh, with God saying, there is no God beside me. There is no Savior even. It says the same thing. So you don't have to worry about that. Like 1 Timothy 3.16 is changed in their Bible. Um, a lot of the, you know, 1 John uh, 5 that talks about the Trinity, gone. So like, you know, these places that you think of, hey, these are great scriptural references that prove this because they're real clear. They change it. So I just, I usually just avoid them altogether because I don't want to get into the argument of the Bible versions. I want to get them the gospel. And if I can use other verses, so be it, which is what I try to do. There's, there's too many things to be arguing about and you don't want to spread yourself so thin that you, you go into all of these different issues. The goal is to get them saved. All that stuff can come later. But they need, they need a reason to change what they believe. Um, and don't let them teach you. If, um, you know, a lot of times you'll run into someone and trying to be nice and, let, and, and talk with them They'll want to just keep on teaching you and telling you the way things are. Don't let the conversation go that way. And if, they, and, if, and if you can't be in charge of the conversation, again, don't waste your time. Because you're not there to be taught. You are there to teach, to teach the gospel, to preach the gospel to them. You're bringing salvation to them. And um, we really need to be careful about the man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition to reject. Uh, we don't, we don't want to be in the business of wasting our time. There's plenty of people out there that will listen and get saved. But for those cases where you do, where you, you maybe, maybe, and maybe it's someone that's a coworker, somewhere where you have a little bit more time and you run into more frequently to be able to talk about the Bible and you don't want to just give up on them, right? Lots of good resources on here. And this, is, this isn't every time. This is just a real cursory, you know, uh, covering of it, but... If they're not if you could present all of this stuff, and they're still like just not getting it, I mean, again, you you know, they're gonna need some more time to think about it. I mean, pray that they'll they'll get it and understand it. But um, that's about it for this workshop. Now, if you want to, what we what we always do afterwards is we spend time practicing what we've learned. So if you feel like you want to, obviously you, you don't have to if you don't want to. If you, if you want to try to practice, um, pair up with someone that can be a pretend Jehovah's Witness or Mormon, especially someone who's been so in plenty of time and can bring up what, what they might say when you try to give the gospel. And try to remember everything else that we've done in the past where you want to be able to try to pretty much control the, the, the conversation. And... Um, but also be able to, to handle the, the conversation as well. So um, we're going to break up now, and if anyone wants...